received. Uh, so, uh, so about three and a half years ago, we're just going to jump in. About uh, three, excuse me, three and a half months ago, President Biden issued an executive order uh, laying out his administration's vision for harnessing artificial intelligence for the benefit of the American people. And so, I'm super pleased to be here on stage with two of the people who are charged with making that vision real. It's all on their shoulders. Uh, so we have Claire Martorana, Joe mentioned she's a uh, federal um, chief information officer, and Mina Shang is the administrator of the U.S. Digital Service. Their jobs differ, um, but they share the idea that they're um, charged with figuring out how to use technology to connect citizens with the many services the federal government provides. And that's a big, gnarly, enduring challenge. A lot of folks in this room have been working on it for uh, years, decades, um, and we have been talking about it a long time. The question now is, can AI help solve that challenge? Can AI actually help provide citizens with the services that they deserve and pay for? And if so, if AI can help, how do you line up people and policies to make that happen? Uh, so Claire, uh, actually Mina, I'd like to start with you now that you're here. <laughs> uh, you've been running the US Digital Service since 2021. Looking at that October executive order from President Biden, how did it change how you do your job? I apologize. Um, I mean, in many ways, very little, right? Um, I think our job has been as fast as possible to recruit exceptional technologists into the government and put them in positions where they can help transform how agencies deliver services, help more effectively deliver individual services, um, and provide implementation consultation to policymakers so that as we make new policies, they are um, well informed by what will truly happen out in the field, out in agencies, in response to those policies. This accelerates that. So one of the things that was most exciting about the EO for me, um, I know there, were, there was something there for everyone, <laughs> but one of the things that was incredibly exciting was the attention and focus it put on talent and on saying the only way that we can meet this moment when technology is poised to so fundamentally change how we deliver everything is for us to have talent inside government who truly understands what that means, how it works, and how to leverage that. And um, you know, for, for all of us wonky folks here, it's pretty hard to get policymakers super excited on questions of like HR and talent. And so this, for me, was incredibly powerful and I think demonstrates the degree of commitment and the understanding um, inherent in that EO that this is such a fundamental part of making this successful. Um, so that was exciting. The rest of it is incredibly exciting stuff for us to work on and a huge additional pool of work for us to do. Um, but that is the thing that will most like change and supercharge and scale up the work that we do, which is how do we bring in the right folks to do the work here. So in some ways, just to follow up on that, it's, it's a recruiting tool to say, we want to, we've been calling for people to come work in government, work it's on tech. It's not just a tool, it's a mandate, right? Okay. It's not only a tool, but it's a, it's, state, it's a statement of purpose, which is we recognize that in order to do that, there will need to be a surge of talent, and we are committed to making that happen. Okay. Claire, can you make this concrete if we can? You oversee hundreds of billions of dollars in IT investments on in, in the part of the federal government. What is a perfect use case for AI that you see? Oh, that... Um... That's a kind of an easy one. Okay. Um, in climate, there's a lot of climate research going on that um, I read from one of our use cases about a, a, a problematic algae bloom that happens in a lake in Guatemala, and they're trying to figure out the algae and why it's blooming and how that relates to temperatures and all kinds of really interesting things, and they use predictive AI um, and we're starting to be able to build some models that we're giving them some really keen insights in order to save some of the fish that are being impacted negatively by this algae bloom. That's one example, firefighting. Um, there's an incredible amount of predictive, um, there, there's, uh, uh, I won't have all the language perfect, but um, there in our forests, there's a fair amount of um, tinder that can be actually seen from space. So you can predict where your wildfires are going to be um, the most gnarly. And so you can get in front of that by actually tending to some of that 
um, uh, ecosystem a little bit differently, or you can also um, just deploy your people more strategically and understand where the fires are going to break out, how they're potentially going to travel. So they're, um, we're using this in a lot of really interesting ways across government that are giving us some really keen insights. But I think the thing that is most interesting about that is, to Mina's point about talent, there's also um, uh, enabling talent. Like, it's not all researchers that we are going to be hiring, right? We need IT teams on the ground in agencies that are um, have modern skills, they are using modern software, they're working on a good tech stack, and that they're able to actually help their ecosystem um, in your agency actually go on a journey of innovation, you know, setting up the governance structure, like doing all of the governmental things that we do to make sure that we are testing things safely and securely. What about on this question of citizen services, things that are, those are great examples, concrete examples, things that actually I'm a citizen interacting with government, can AI, is AI useful in, that, in those sort of interactions? Yeah, I, I don't think we're there yet, Okay, candidly. I think we're, we're beginning this journey um, and there are probably very specific use cases that have even evolved since we did our last use case inventory. Well, okay. for, for example, I mean, right. just a, a study just came out demonstrating that in customer service call centers, utilizing AI in a complementary fashion, not to replace humans, but to help bring new people, to help surface the right answers to the people answering the phones and to help make them more productive has dramatically increased productivity, particularly for sort of baseline um, customer service reps, right? So um, it brings sort of new folks up to a certain level and it allows you to have a much higher level of performance in a call center. We get millions of phone, the federal government writ large gets millions of phone calls every single month. And so, and one of the challenges that we consistently have is having the right productivity and the right levels of staffing in that workforce. And so the opportunity to get everyone up to the right level there, utilizing new technologies is tremendous. It doesn't require us to invent something new. This is, but it does require us to put the right evaluation criteria, the right safeguards in place, and then to do normal implementation of new technologies in a product environment that you know is, is in use in other places in industry as well. The U.S. Digital Service was created in many ways as a response to the failure of healthcare.gov back in 2013. If we had all, you know, all our AI tools up and running back then, would that have helped at all? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, I think um, no. I, I mean, I think, and some of that is why having the right talent is no is essential, right? Having cool technology is no substitute for having the right talent. Claire likes to joke that most of our joke slash be completely serious, right? That most of our problems are not technology problems and most challenges in technology organizations are not technology challenges. Um, having different technologies would not have changed the fundamental challenges that we had with manager management and multiple contractors and inappropriate management and accountability. So I think um, we still would have had a complicated situation. And so we're not going to eliminate the need for people who know how to manage um, complex technology situations and for an understanding of like how those interface with the policy and the end objectives. And in fact, I think because AI is going to reshape how organizations think about their productivity and their work, you have an even deeper need for having really strategic, thoughtful people who understand how technology influences mission um, in the room. Do Claire, did you have a thought? Or, yeah, yeah. I, I think that it, it really, you know, the way that we cascade um, uh, information in government is, is unique and a little bit different, right? Congress passes a law. Um, we then, uh, or the president signs an executive order. Mm -hmm. And um, thinking that just from those materials that teams can be effective and impactful delivering the intent of it it is preposterous. Like mm -hmm. these are written at a hundred thousand <laughs> foot view, and we have to translate them for every single agency use case to the best of our ability. So we've been trying to focus on something we call human-centered policy design, where we're actually getting the policies out to the the audience, right? To making sure that we're working in in AI use case in uh, specifically, civil society, academics. 
uh, labor unions, like an entire cross-section, federal employees, federal agencies, and really trying to make sure that we're hearing from them about the obstacles on the ground that are challenging them, um, whether it's funding, whether it's the color of money, whether it's staffing, um, whether it's lack of interest from their program partners in not um, wanting to take a risk, like thinking something's too risky to attempt. So um, we're really trying to look at this kind of from all of those different dimensions. But I think just foundationally, it's about talent, having the right people in the right rooms and at the table to be able to translate. Does that, did you? you well, and just to expand on that, it's not just about new talent, right? It's also like leaders need to have an understanding about how technology affects the mission that they are of the organization that they are leading, right? And we see this in organizations across the board, and that is equally true in in government. So, you know, some of it is recruiting in new people, and some of it is making sure that leaders and people across the board truly understand how this will influence their work. In that vein of, Claire, you talked about the challenge of the president issues an executive order that doesn't make it real necessarily, you know, out in the world. There was an executive order in um, right after President Biden was sworn in in December, I think, of 2021 um, about transforming the customer experience, right? The sort of language of government, one of the very, you know, essential things that exists to do is there's these services that it provides. It has to actually make those services accessible and meaningful to people. Is there a way, just to play devil's advocate, that that's a lot of work that's still being done, right? Meaning you're working on that day in and day out. The idea that AI is going to take folks' eye off the ball, right? It's like we're still ch working on building usable, accessible websites and apps, and now we're adding this AI layer, and everything needs to be a chatbot, and we still haven't solved the sort of basic you know, technological questions that we've been talking about for a long time. Is that is that cynical to think that way, that the AI is just like the, the shiny object now that's kind of um, going to distract us? I mean, I, I think that they address different parts of the challenge, right? So the customer experience EO is really saying, this is how we should evaluate ourselves. This is what we strive to accomplish. This is how we as agencies should seek to evaluate whether or not we're meeting people's needs and how we should manage our programs. So that is like a mission and an outcomes um, piece. I think a lot of what's in the AIEO is much more about tools and accountability, right? So it's, okay, in service of providing better customer experience, what are the tools that are, valuable, if, that are available to you? What people does it take to accomplish that? Mm -hmm. And how do you need to put safeguards and other things in place to make sure that you are doing that in a fair, equitable, reasonable, not creating harm way. So the thinking being, you don't have to use AI, but if you do, here's that's how you read the executive order? Yes. I mean, okay. uh, uh, as with anything, you, you it's another set of technology tools. It's not a mandate to use AI in every possible scenario where one could use AI. It's use the best possible tools. And if those include AI, we have to think pretty hard about, we have to make sure that we understand what we're doing. Yeah, and I think on the customer experience executive order, it was also you know um, challenging agencies to know their customer like really know their customer, know the, you know, the journeys that they go on, the moments that matter, the interactions between agencies where someone might fall out of um, uh, seeking to you know, get an answer uh, from the government and how we might actually design our interactions um, to uh, serve that individual. So I think it, was, it really kind of started at a higher level it wasn't about the tools and the technology. It was really about, you know, you are uh, a, a senior person at an agency, you have a set of customers, you also have a set of employees who are also customers, and you need to create the discipline um, uh, and hire people that have familiarity with a more modern way of working so that you're not just writing, you know, one RFP and deciding that you already have the solution. You have an openness to listening to your customers and potentially finding gaps in the service that you're delivering and recognizing that you have to do some work. It could be cross-functional work. It could actually be technology work to help the person get the benefits or get the answer that they need in the environment. Did you have? I think that's right. I, you know, I, I enjoyed your question. I, I think 
technology for technology's sake is like never the right idea. And AI in one form or another has been around for a long time. We have an explosion of interest in part because it is solving people's needs now, right? And it is addressing things. And so in the same vein, I think all of this is about what technology actually solves the problems in front of us and how do we make sure that we do that thoughtfully and use the tools that are available, um, not just implement the coolest new thing, even if it has no practical application for folks. So um, just think it's very important to like make sure that we're, we're using the right tool for fixing the problem in front of us. The, uh, one of the learnings um, in the AI world from the last several months, couple last couple of years, has been that it takes a whole lot of money to, to build uh, AI well. Um, that's why it tends to be these bigger corporations, these very well-funded uh, corporations that have done it so far. The funding model in the federal government, at least traditionally, has been very, you know, fits and spurts. It's a little bit of funding here. The program didn't immediately show that it changed the world, so you get no more funding. How do you sort of marry those two? If you th think the federal, if you stipulate the federal government should be working in the AI, implementing AI tools into their work, how do you marry that with the funding model that says, you know, this is six months, five, you know, at the most five years that you're going to get money for? Ah, uh, budget, budget, my favorite, <laughs> my favorite subject. Uh, um, that's this is hard, right? This is hard. We are we are going on a transformational journey, but I will say we have consistently been investing in a lot of capabilities that we have not, like just as a member of the public, I, I maybe would not be quite as familiar with. For example, the national labs. Our national labs are an absolute treasure. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, we run out of Oak Ridge, uh, the fastest supercomputer in the world. Um, the, the supercomputer frontier that uh, replaced Summit 2, which was Summit 1's, pre right? like we're doing, investments on an annual basis for many, many years, building out some baseline capabilities. I think what we don't do as good a job of, and there's a really interesting opportunity, is looking across the ecosystem to find the areas where we do have capabilities and try and match some of the agency needs to those capabilities. So some of our agencies actually run um, uh, programs on these supercomputers, right? The VA has a million veteran program where they're doing a DNA uh, uh, project for the last 10 years, I think. Um, and they are actually using some of the compute power at Oak Ridge to actually um, try and accelerate some of their key learnings. So th those are examples, I think, of where we are making investments over a long period of time, sometimes generational investments. And we aren't necessarily connecting some of the operating needs in government to the capabilities that we have. So it's going to be hard for every agency to go through this journey. Um, but we have places like NASA, right? Like we have places that have been leading, leading edge um, across the board. What we're trying to figure out how to do through some of our communities is how do we connect the dots? between the places that are doing this well already, the key learning and the talent that they have in those environments, and then how do we match that up with an agency that's just really struggling, you know, potentially the thought of them bringing co-pilot into their environment um, is going to be a lot more complex than it is in some other environments. So we're also trying through some of these councils and the convening powers that we have to bring people together to try and unearth some of the assets that we have in government to try and figure out how we can leverage them um, to get to where we need to go faster and learn and share because it's in a trusted government environment mm -hmm. that we can actually share information with us, uh, with each other um, a, a little bit more expeditiously. Mm -hmm. The, uh, one of the hallmarks of the digital service has always been, let's break big technology projects into smaller parts, iterate, test it out, see how it works. AI, again, requires a lot of money. It can take a lot of years to sort of test out a model, see what you learn. It's not an iterative in the same way that like a smaller software project might be. I mean, you can disagree with the premise of the question, but how do you marry that USDS approach of sort of scrappy, quick, move quickly with AI projects that can be... Uh, you know, much bigger in scope. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I think the AI companies would say we've built it piece by piece and year, year on year. Um, that said, you know, the government, the federal government does tons of huge inspirational shit stuff. Sorry. <laughs> Huge in for inspirational things. We also do some basic stuff, right? We answer the phones. We like answer people's questions. We do incredibly basic things over and over and over again at massive scale. And those basic things are incredibly important to people. We are having a conversation with millions of families about their food insecurity. We are having critically important conversations, but they're not, they don't require a supercomputer. They require fundamentally doing a good job of engineering a straightforward product um, in like using basic iterative principles that allow us to work with the humans who are affected, with the agency and the policymakers, and with the technology that's available. And one of the things that AI brings us is a new assortment of technology that is available. It requires us to be thoughtful as with all technology. You know, a decade ago, we had to make sure that we were thoughtful about the implications of using the cloud in a bunch of contexts. And now we have to be thoughtful about the implications. But similarly, we could say it costs a lot of money to build a whole public cloud, but using it is a pretty straightforward thing. And using a lot of these AI capabilities that others have spent a lot of money to develop is something that sh can and should be part of sort of baseline normal software projects and, and service delivery. And just one thing to add really quickly, we also have a lot of paper in government, like, like <laughs> so a lot paper. of paper. And we have fax machines. Like, like we can get past this, right? Like that is the, the hope of, of AI and just modern software evolving you know, not just putting everything in an AI bucket, but like yeah. that we have big opportunities to do really basic things well. Okay. And that's inspirational. The last minute, you've both talked about the importance of attracting people to government to do this work, people like yourselves that have private sector experience. The other than saying there's a lot of paper, come help us you know, solve that. How, what is your current pitch, your current best pitch very quickly for you talk to folks, please come do this work. Very quickly. I'll jump in quickly because Mina recruits every single day, all day long. So um, it is, you, you can have an impact in government that you cannot have, that I have not ever been able to have in the private sector. You can work on missions that span everything from banking to farming to space, right? There is something across government for every single person's interest. Um, and you will be going someplace where you're rare. You're rare. Your talents are rare. Um, there aren't a ton of technologists um, that are my normal colleagues from private sector companies um, that I interact with here in government. So going where you're rare, where you, where you can drive a great impact is pretty much gets everybody that I talk to. You know, your 22nd pitch to... Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I... Claire said it perfectly. I mean, there is no place, this is, I don't know, my eighth or ninth job, there is no other place where every single day you can go to bed and know that you have made such a large impact on the lives of real people in complicated, desperate, or important circumstances. And I think um, you work with amazing colleagues, you're rare, and that means you can have outsized impact. And so it's just a tremendously um, rewarding place to work. Uh, I learn new things every single day, uh, and it's just an incredible, uh, an incredible opportunity to serve uh, your country. Okay, it seems like one takeaway is the work's the same. AI is maybe a new tool in the in the toolbox. Um, but does that work? Good summary. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you both. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, thank you all for being here. Yeah.